I felt it, yeah. Mm -hmm. What comes through? Uh, the next poem is a little lighter, although it's not. <laughs> um, bury me, it's called. Bury me in the fetal position, naked as first light. Take my hard edges, my paper thin skin, and fold me gently as if a butterfly, wing upon wing, knees, chest, head, in prayer to one another. Place my body in muslin, a chrysalis, simple and white. Entwine my folded hands to a rooting birch seed. Sprinkle in moist earth and the oyster shells we found one night under the moon's ebbing light. Will you do this for me? There's more. Find a meadow where the birches stand. Bury me still flesh among the ferns, anemone and wood sorrel. As the years pass, you can watch me grow. One day, orange honeysuckle will encircle my bark, reminding you of when once we held each other under another weeping birch. Beautiful. Thank you. This poem was inspired by a poem by Etheridge Knight, which is called Self-Portrait with Tumbling and Lasso. <clears throat> and it, this poem is called Self-Portrait Self -Portrait with Rosettes. And it's a little bit different form than I'm used to, so hang on. <laughs> I'm turmoil and a raven's rattle. I'm lifting heavy stones from pockets throwing lifelines like memory, everything returns. I'm dreaming of a fragile fortune, an intrusion of flames. On walls, I'm painting rosettes in relief, the faint smell of cardamom. My arms wave wholly around. I'm partying in the death house. I gave it all I had, now I want it back the dew-misted mornings, even the tears of missing you, the melodies, I sing my meadow alive, a red howl, I'm saying over and over, you are only what you imagine yourself to be, I'm haunted, strings unravel like spider threads in the storm's turbulence, my teeth are stones I guard at night, memory locked inside. I'm patient as a wave, slowly wearing away hardness. My language, a bone deep song to the moon. Thank you. Lovely. And I have one more. And this is a poetic form called a glossa, except mine's a demiglossa, so it's only half. But a glossa is a form that uses, borrows another poet's um, lines from their poem. I guess it can be your own poem, but mostly it's other poets. And um, it consists of four stanzas and the borrowed lines end each stanza. And each stanza is 10 lines and then the borrowed line. So this is called Pair of Lovers and Flowers. And it's a demiglossa. And the lines I've borrowed are from Mary Oliver. Two lines. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Oh, and this is in honor of my sweet dog Coco that I had to put down a couple of, well, not that long ago, two weeks ago. This is in her honor. On an ordinary day, you walk up the mountain, your dog trailing neatly behind you. She jolts ahead in chase of something neither you nor she can see, a rustle in the brush, a scent carried on the clean open air to her nose. She hoots in anticip anticipation, bounces through the shallow grass as if spring loaded, leaves you longing to follow, 
to slide along the underbrush, to shed your human skin for fur. You remember then, you only have to let the soft animal of your body be the guide. You drop to the ground, slither, slide, thorns pricking your thin hide. It doesn't matter. You wiggle out of your tight casing, cast aside shoes for soft padded paws. Down in the lower field, sweet scents of yarrow and musk mallow lift you up. As in Chagall's famous painting, embraced by your lover, you drift above the church steeple, saturated blue and red, letting your whole body love what it loves. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Nancy. You so oh, big jazz hands here. And yeah, we're, we're sending our appreciation and you'll see in the chat so many, so many wonderful <laughs> words of appreciation for you, Nancy. Um, wow, you longing to follow her, and and we did enjoy so much following you where your where your images, imagery, and words took us. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so for, much for everything that you shared. Okay, bravo. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was lovely. Just giving it a minute so we can absorb your images and. Uh, just sit with that for a minute. Um, we're going to um, next uh, be inviting, uh, let me see, can I see you there, Gary? Are you there? Are you ready? Okay. All right. It is our honor to welcome you, Gary Geddes, who has written and edited more than 50 books of poetry, fiction, drama, nonfiction, criticism, and anthologies, and been the recipient of at least a dozen literary awards, including the Commonwealth Poetry Prize, America's Region, National Magazine Gold Award, and the Gabriela Mistral Prize from the Government of Chile. Um, you know, what can we say? That seems, that's a very short bio. <laughs> and I, I don't know if it can properly encompass your accomplishments in the world of poetry. I know, um, I, I found a quotation that uh, something you said in 2008, I think this was in BC Book World, where you said, I think of writing as a way of getting in touch with my deepest feelings. I don't lay these feelings out on the page like dripping laundry. I wring them out and cut them up into very different forms to make something new with words that will take others deeply into themselves, not into my life and its problems. Problems. And, and I'm thinking about just one uh, example of many, I'm sure, of people who have encountered those, those forms that you've made and, and what you've made of your experience and, and reflections um, in words. I, I, even so many years ago, when my children were really young I, and had a preschooler at home, and it was, I remember being briefly alone at home, I had a chance to rest and I was sitting on the sofa and listening to the CBC and I'd almost drifted off. And there, uh, Gary Geddes was reading his poem, Sandra Lee Shore, about a young woman who was shot by the National Guard um, at Kent State in 1970. In, and I can tell you, I was jolted awake. On, on so many levels. And that poem has really stayed with me. And it, it reminds me again and again about the power of poetry to connect the reader, the listener, not just to the, the tragedy of that event, but to the brilliant originality and beauty and value of every life and to help us see beyond the, the headlines and, and to really to shift our consciousness. So I, I'm just uh, honored, as I know everyone here is, to welcome you to Planet Earth Poetry this evening. Welcome, Gary. Unmute, Gary. <laughs> oh, I think you're, st yeah, there you go. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, it's great. To, it's really great to be here. I'm so thrilled to have the chance to share with you folks, poets and poetry lovers, and uh, all of the uh, all all of the the things that I wanted to happen during the long silence of COVID have just begun now. So it's it's a real thrill to to me to be here. I'm talking to you from the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Penelicate people on Thetis Island. And I think of them always when I'm not just giving acknowledgements, but day to day, because I live a few hundred yards away from the infamous Cooper Island Residential School. And I spent five years to do my part uh, in reconciliation by working with uh, interviewing elders across the country uh, who have been in the segregated Indian hospitals uh, for a book called Medicine Unbundled, A Journey Through the Minefields of Indigenous Healthcare. Uh, and uh, I was in, encouraged and in, indeed bullied to do that by Joan Morris, Songhees elder in Victoria. And I'm so grateful to Joan for doing that. And it's, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Leanne and Zoe, directors of Planet Earth, for, for making this event possible. I'm delighted to be here tonight, and I'm happy to have had a chance to uh, hear some interesting poems from other people and to share this uh, stage with Nancy Eisenman. You know, I'm, I think that poetry is a call to action and a healing source. It's got unique strategies that allow it to fly under the radar, to nest in the ear, and to get into the bloodstream and change the chemistry of our bodies and to change the way we see the world. A year ago, David Stover at Rock Mills Press in Oakville phoned to ask if I had any out of print work that I'd like to bring back into the light. As the former president of Oxford, Canada, David knew me from my years as one of their editors of, of some of their anthologies. Anyway, his, his offer even then came as a surprise, but a very, very welcome one. Most, most of my longer narrative poems were no longer available. So I didn't have to think too long about David's offer. I, I decided to combine four of the out of print, but hopefully not out of date narratives into a single volume. They're all about in some way or another about the uh, physical, psychological and environmental ravages of, of war and of conquest. So I'm going to start with a poem that's not in not in the uh, in the ventriloquist. It's but it is one that you've already been introduced to so graciously by Leanne. It's called Sandra Lee Scheuer, and it's about the killings at Kent State. When I heard about it, I was protesting the escalation of the Vietnam War outside the U.S. consulate in Toronto. Someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, have you heard about Kent State? Well, four students were killed and nine others were injured when the Ohio National Guard opened fire on the students, unarmed students. I felt rage, I felt shock. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to say something and I tried to write about it. It felt as if a, a, something, a gap as large as the Grand Canyon had opened up between myself and my, my parents' generation. I scribbled away and I produced diatribe after diatribe against American foreign policy, but none of them were worth uh, thinking about. There were already enough bad poems on that subject. But I had the luck to be a, a, a writer in residence at uh, the University of Alberta six years after this event. And I went out during a snowstorm on White Avenue and I took refuge in the We Book Inn, a tiny bookstore. And I found myself in front of the political science section uh, picking up a little book called The Killings at Kent State by that amazing American journalist, I.F. Stone. 
he had a something called the Eye of Stones Weekly, and even his enemies read it to see how things stood in their in their country. One of the I bought the book for a buck and took it home, and one of the uh, stories just stuck with me. It was about a young woman, one of the victims, and there were four details about Sandra Lee Scheuer. She was a speech therapy student. She liked to roller skate. She was very tidy and she was not particularly political. So I chucked my notes, six years of notes and wrote this poem in a couple of hours and I'm gonna just transfer it over on the middle of the screen to cover my own face here. Killed by the Ohio National Guard on May 4, 1970. You might have met her on a Saturday night, cutting precise circles clockwise at the moon glow roller rink, or walking with quick step between the campus and a green two-story house, where the room was always tidy, the bed made, the books in confraternity on the shelves. She did not throw stones, major in philosophy, or set fire to buildings, though acquaintances say, she hated war, had heard of Cambodia. In truth, she wore a modicum of a makeup, a brassiere, and could no doubt more easily have married a guardsman than cursed or put a, rifle, put a flower in his rifle barrel. While the armories burned, she studied, bent low over notes, speech therapy books, pages open at sections on impairment, physiology. And while they milled and shouted on the commons, she helped a boy named Billy with his lisp, saying, hiss, Billy, like a snake. That's it. Sss. Tongue well up and back behind your teeth. Now buzz, Billy, like a bee. Feel the air vibrating in my windpipe as I breathe. As she walked in sunlight through the parking lot at noon, feeling the world a passing lovely place, a young guardsman who had his sights on her was going down on one knee as if he might propose. His declaration, unmistakable, articulate, flowered within her, passed through her neck, severed her trachea, taking her breath away. Now who will burn the midnight oil for Billy, ensure the perilous freedom of his speech? And who will see her skating at the moon glow roller rink, the eight small wooden wheels making their countless revolutions on the floor? Someone once asked me, uh, where, where do you find your subjects? I said, I don't find them, they find me. I wasn't really joking. Uh, the, the book's title, The Ventriloquist, uh, may help explain that. It seems to me, from my experience in the poems in, the vent in, in this particular book, that there is a legion of disembodied voices from the recent or distant past, silenced by turmoil and time, that are wandering the earth looking for a sucker just like me to tell their stories. So when they find me, it's exciting, it's challenging, it's scaring, scary because it can take up years of my life and make me go to places in myself and in others I just as soon ignore. Those places that Yeats had in mind when he said, I must go down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. So I'm going to now shift over into some of these other pieces, but the point there is that it's, a, it's like the phrase, the ventriloquism of history, which a graduate student of mine once shared with me. It seems so apt as a description of my work. All those voices that have, people that have reached out and taken me by the throat and asked to have their stories told. I'm going to read you some pieces from various of the poems that uh, are in this book, but since they're all book-length poems, 
I'm going to just have to do a, a few fragments here and there. In November 1941, 1975 soldiers from the Winnipeg Grenadiers and the Royal Rifles of Canada from Quebec City set sail from Vancouver. They were being sent on an impossible mission to defend the Crown Colony of Hong Kong against an inevitable attack by war-hardened Japanese troops. They fought bravely, but they didn't stand a chance, and they surrendered on Christmas Day, the survivors spending three and a half years as slave labor in POW camps in Hong Kong and Japan. Here are a few voices from the past that took me by the throat and demanded their story to be told. This is from Kravinchuk. We were out back in the reservoir when this nip plane comes over the ridge and opens fire. As the shells hit, a trail of dust devils snakes towards us across the valley. We stand gaping like a couple of yokels until it's just about overhead, then dive into the makeshift bunker. Harris starts screaming, I'm hit, I'm hit. Oh God, Sam, you can feel the blood on my shoulder. His tragic look is so authentic you'd think he rehearsed it from old movies. He'd run off screaming like that too if I hadn't grabbed both of his ankles and shouted, T you stupid fucker, I spilled the thermos down your back. This next piece is spoken by Henderson and it's the last moment in the fall of Hong Kong. I did most of my fighting in Repulse Bay in a hotel half full of civilians. We took up position in a plush suite on the second floor. One of the men sat in an armchair scanning hills out back with binoculars. When he spotted movement, I'd swing into the window and fire, then drop back. Suddenly, there was a woman in the doorway saying, my dog, I'm looking for water for my dog. We pulled her down out of the line of fire and gave the dog water, radiator water we used for tea. Later, when the Japanese were two football fields away and their planes were dive bombing the barracks, I thought of that woman and her parting comment. If he bothers you by barking, shoot him. This next one, is about the final attack on the uh, on the uh, soldiers in the uh, in the hospital. That's by someone named Sullivan. There's a strange hush at St. Stephen's as we wait for them to storm the college. Nurses drift like butterflies among the injured, offering a word, a touch, a cigarette. When the enemy bursts through the door, I'm lying on a cot at the far end of the corridor, my head bandaged, my legs supported in a, a sling. Two soldiers proceed to bayonet the sick and wounded in their beds to a chorus of screams and protests. A nurse throws herself on top of one of our boys to protect him. It might have been the kid from Queens. They are both killed by a single thrust of the bayonet. I suppose they were sweethearts. Pinned at last, she does not struggle. Her hands open and close like tiny wings, and the dark stain on her white starched uniform spreads like a chrysanthemum, a blood red sun. I cut the cord supporting my leg, slip on the nearest smock and stand foolishly at attention, making the salute. My right index finger brushes the damp cotton of the bandage. Later, the butchers are shot by their own officers. One apparently had lost a brother in the final assault. Now this, this piece is uh, a, a, a little prose section in the, in the middle of this long uh, series of uh, monologues by, by the soldiers. And it's the story someone is telling about Mallory, by Mallory, but about a French Canadian named Delisle. We party again at 6 a.m. Low-lying fog over the harbor as we board the ferry that takes us from Sham Shui Po to Kai Tak. Bitter cold. Can see only the peak of Victor over Victoria now. 
No wonder money builds high up, a hedge against fire, flood, disease, the poor. I'm working alongside Delille, who can barely raise his shovel, never mind singing his perfect, in his perfect tenor voice. The poor devil has been down in sick bay for weeks with dysentery and electric feet. The gray skin is stretched over his bones like kite paper. I try to cover for him by working a little faster than usual, but I, I know I can't keep up the pace. There must be a hundred of us working the reclamation, dumping earth from high ground to extend the runway into the sea. You have to keep moving or freeze. Dummy, speedo! The guards are shouting to our left, trying to make us be to make better time. I suppose they get more rations if the work goes well and a few extra inches are gained each day. I fill Delille's basket as lightly baskets as lightly as I can and help him up with them. He moves off ahead of me so thin he looks as if he might crumble under the weight. The concentration required to put one foot ahead of the other must be enormous, but he plods towards with the, fabric, the fabricated shoreline. He's not quite over the dysentery and the backs of his legs are stained from the thin bile that passes through him. He resembles a mechanical scale, the two baskets suspended from the ends of a pole at slightly different levels at his sides. If we can make it to the edge of the, without attracting attention, no one will notice the size of his load. We are only 20 yards from the water when the bas one basket dips below knee level and brushes the ground. It's just enough to betray him. He falls straight forward on his face. The weaker baskets unfortunately remain upright and reproachful beside him. I stand at attention my legs aching under the weight. Delisle does not move. I think his heart has given out, but I can hear him whisper, Je m'excuse, Alvin, je m'excuse. Two guards are kicking and shouting. They drag him onto his feet and knock him back and forth like a rag doll. One of them reaches into a half-filled basket and throws a handful of dirt in his face. The closed eyes seem to infuriate him as much as the baskets. Dummy, cheat, no good. Delisle's balls choose that moment to discharge, though he has, eaten, he has eaten nothing for days. It's a miracle of creation or criticism. Ex nihilo fecit. The guard's face contorts as he strikes Delisle in the mouth with his rifle butt. Then they are dra dragging him to the water's edge. All work on the reclamation has stopped. He is on his knees and has begun to sing one of those folk songs that have followed us from Sherbrooke to Newfoundland, across Canada, aboard the Awatia to Hong Kong. I can feel my legs giving out over the ba and the bamboo pole cutting into my shoulders. The fog is breaking up and sunlight reflects off the sword as it falls repeatedly on his neck. He's remained somehow on his knees and has to be pushed over. One of them kicks the head down into the, his head down the small embankment into the sea. Several of us are detailed to dig a shallow grave and he is buried headless beneath the runway of the Kai Tak airport. Uh, I don't have a lot of time. I'd like to just read a few little sections from War and Other Measures. This is in response to the death of Paul Joseph Chartier in the House of Commons on May 18th, 1966 at 2.15 p.m. He was dismissed, well, he died when the bomb he was carrying exploded in, in one of the men, men's washrooms in the House of Commons. I was so appalled by the media response to this. They dismissed him as a ter terrorist, a sociopath, an American copycat, a bumbling and not so beautiful loser who only managed to kill himself. No one even paused to ask what personal experiences and systemic problems might have driven a person in Canada to the breaking point of considering violence to others or to himself. 
I wanted to write a novel in verse form that would answer some of these questions. So what I'm offering here is chapter one, 1973 in Europe, our French Canadian narrator, who is not really Chartier, but my imagination of him, finds himself in London and then working in the French underground resistance movement. He's clearly suffering from what we call P PTSD. And I'll just read two or three pieces here. Standing on the escalator at Piccadilly, she puts her hand inside my trousers without turning. Her body on the dirty spread is covered with scars. She weeps as I kiss them, her deep wound closing around me. I speak of Montreal. Somehow my being Canadian amuses her. Our cigarettes pencil the darkness. In the morning she is gone, the pillow scarred on the floor, a spent cartridge of lipstick. Train to York in nighttime, frail child, legs dangling from carriage seat, her head an enormous wasp's nest of bandage and cradling a china doll. Tired man looks up at me, smiles. Badly hit, he says, deaf too, came over high, couldn't hear until it hit, the whole house, doll came through without a scratch. Fancy that. Traveling by night, stopping in barns and haystacks, no charge for the rats. We make it finally behind the lines. Guards at checkpoint, officious, heel clicking, everything in order, Fournier behind me on a bicycle. Frightened, wanting only to run, walking down the road conspicuous as a tourist, the back of my head grown suddenly bare truck stops, so close, their soft young faces sucking courage from a cigarette. Surprised by my own reflection in the windscreen, five days growth and wearing these filthy overalls, I take the lift they offer. Three sticks of dynamite well placed under the Jeep, one infantry colonel, one driver, two ambivalent authorities. Afterward, the reprisals. This is war, I say, I have orders. I have to keep moving, fear my constant companion, wisdom leaking to the winds like gas. Break the chain of command, always the same pattern, a child's game of checkers. Jump one, lose five, a new crop of French widows. One more grateful than the rest gives me food and shelter for a week. As the husband dreams his outrage in the parlor, I spill my grief into her body. Fournier, found with a carving knife in his throat, his smile infectious, even in death. Talking to myself again, grown more taciturn than ever to hide the patois. My hands fascinate me, two live animals at my sides. They feed me, light cigarettes, help themselves to my things. Night creatures, they live by day in my pockets. I watch them fold and unfold, move among the objects on the table, wonder how much longer they will need me. I do not want to understand their language. I think I'll stop there, uh, Leanne and Zoe, uh, and leave some time for questions. <laughs>